Hello everyone, thank you so much for choosing this seminar out of, I know that you have a selection of more than 1,000 other seminars here at the Didacta Conference. Uh, my name is Carl Hamilton, I have a background as a researcher at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Nowadays I am fully engaged in this project here that I'm here to talk to you about. This is about migrant students and how we can help them reach farther in schools. Um, Sweden and Germany have uh, many similar experiences over the last five years in terms of receiving migrants and refugees. And the project that we've been running has made a few lessons, learned a few lessons that I hope I can share with you and make useful. So uh, I just want to ask how many of you went to, went, went, go back in time to when you went to school? How many of you had a teacher that spoke the same language as your parents? Did you have the same language at home and in school? Yeah, so that's pretty, pretty much all of you. And that's a good thing. You might not think about that, but that is really a pri privilege, that, because that matters. Let's look, look at some stats talking about that. This is OECD, a report from uh, the year before last, showing how the year of arrival in this specific case to Switzerland, but it's this, uh, the pattern is the same wherever you go. The later you arrive, the higher the age of the arrival, the lower the score on test, the lower the performance in school. It's not very hard to understand why. I mean, if you, if you come as a 15-year-old, you have a shorter time span. You're squeezed to catch up with language and curriculum differences and cultural differences and everything. We noticed this in Sweden several years ago. Uh, these dates, these dates are from uh, also from 2015 and they have slightly improved compared to when we started the project. This is admission rate to upper secondary school in Sweden by um, year of origin, year of arrival. So for all students, 88% are admitted, <coughs> eligible to upper secondary school. And the later you arrive, the lower the share of students are eligible for upper secondary school. Only 27% if you arrive the last four years before grade 10. Now, if you um, want to do something about this, where do you start? We gathered experts and professionals from a wide range of fields and launched a pro project which we call School for All from Day One. Today we have 28 municipalities in Sweden, two universities and a digital publishing house working together. And so far we're helping Swedish students in six languages and Tanzanian students in two languages in a bit of a side project that I'm going to touch upon briefly later. Uh, and as of this year we're also starting to look at Germany. We have some uh, interesting questions from schools in Germany and we hope that we can share some of our experience here. So the goal of this project is threefold. The three things that we want to deliver to uh, our students and to our teachers. The first one is very tangible. It's a set of tools and materials, multilingual di digital tools and materials that you can use to teach and help the students in more than one language. Then it is methods, how you do things, what works and what doesn't. And then it is scientific knowledge. We're working together, together with universities who go with us, share the knowledge that they already have, and who observe what we're doing to bring out more knowledge from the project. So this is what we're doing. We've been going on for two years, and we're starting to see results in terms of higher academic performance of our students. And, but we have also learned some very fundamental things about multilingual learning that I'm here to share with you today. All right, so we have learned a lot from these two years with the project and I'm going to share with you three of our most important lessons from that. All right, lesson number one, get started right away with the subject matter. That means don't start to practice German or Swedish or whatever is the language of the school and keep doing only that until you know the language and then start with the subject. And there are some Good reason for this. We hear the same stories over and over again when we come out to schools. That when students arrive, there is a certain glow in their eyes. They have a willingness to learn that 
most other students don't. There's something, uh, the level of engagement with schools when they arrive is something that you want to harness and uh, harvest and, and do something with. Most of them, they're going to be engineers and doctors and pilots. And if you can meet the students at this high level of engagement, then you have a lot to win. If you can give them challenges that are so hard that they have to really fight for it, but also support so that they get a reasonable chance to meeting those challenges, then these are your, likely to be your best students. Now, if you fail to do that, if you lose them, uh, if you put them on hold, put them in a room down the corridor and say, now nah, you give them old training material, and if you fail to challenge them, it's very tough for them. These are teenagers. They're struggling to find a social identity, and if school, if only half-heartedly welcoming them, they will have to find their identity somewhere else outside of school, and often in opposition to school. And once they have formed their identity as a person who is not a school person, it's very tough to win them back. So you need to grab them early and give them challenging exercises and support. In the project, we re, um, repeatedly bring in students, both migrant students and non-migrant students, and focus group and test things on them and really evaluate what you're doing. It's a great experience to see that because you notice that 14-year-olds are pretty much the same wherever. There is, in, in a group of 10, there is always one tough guy. There is um, the clown of the group who always have a funny thing to say. There is some uh, smart person who knows all the answers. And then there is one person that is not represented in the migrant groups. And that is those who have given up. Uh, it's kind of passive behavior. They sit down and slowly sink down into their jacket and just glaze over their eyes and you go walk up to them and try to feel the pulse and <laughs> it's like they hibernate and just wait for secondary school to be over. You don't see that with the recently arrived migrants. They're forward-leaning and engaging and you really need and want to gather that. OECD made the same uh, discovery. They said this in their report from 2015, uh, integrate language and subject learning from the earliest grades. All right, that's easier said than done, isn't it? But that is what our project is trying to do. Uh, second lesson that we have learned is what benefits special needs students often benefits all students. What do we mean by that? If you, look in a bathroom or a kitchen today, you're very likely to see a faucet that works like the one on the picture here, that you can operate with one hand. That was originally developed for people with muscle disabilities or rheumatism, uh, who couldn't operate traditional uh, knob-turning faucets. Now they're the standard, because we discovered that what was good for the special needs group turned out to be good for everyone. And the same is true for us, the same is true in a teaching environment. When you teach newly arrived migrants, there is a much larger spread in previous knowledge in what they know from beforehand compared to your normal, uh, your everyday class. So you will be forced to find methods to address those who need extra challenge and those who are lagging behind. You already have that situation in any class, but since the spread is, spread is much bigger in the migrant class, you will have to develop more um, solutions for that. What we do in the project is we find, uh, let's see where I have that. Uh, there it is. So when our teachers work with the migrant class, they can hand out assignments and they can hand out different assignments. Someone who is way ahead of the class can get an extra tough one and so those who need a bit of extra support can get a a few extra assignments on a lower level to catch up. But you can do that without working twice or three times as much because all the lessons are there and you get a nice and neat summary where you can keep track of who have done their homework, which questions, which subjects, which words were most troubling for them. 
in, in what specific areas do you need to give them extra support? This makes it easier to deal with a class with a widespread as a migrant class, but it also helps uh, your average class. Same thing goes for uh, vocabulary. Newly arrived migrants struggling with the language, it takes time to learn all the spe subject specific words, but you also need to learn all those other school schooly words. So some examples here. Your biology and your history and your physics teacher will teach you words like photosynthesis, reformation, kinetic energy. But then there is the whole other bunch of terms and concepts which are required if you're going to catch up and um, understand and be able to do this, uh, the kind of analysis that is required in school, but they're not part of a specific subject. And when you work with migrant students, this becomes uh, very clear that you have to explicitly teach uh, on this part of the language. And you know what? When you do that for the migrants, it turns out that this also greatly benefits the more disadvantaged children who are non-migrants, because it's exactly the same kind of <coughs> words uh, that children from uh, families with a low level of education also struggle to learn. So lesson number two is that what is good for special needs students is almost always good for the rest of the students as well. Which brings us to lesson number three. Keep developing the student's first language. So, um, intuitively, uh, lay people and politicians sometimes think that, well, just teach them German first and then they can join any class. OECD says, no, don't do that. Start teaching subject matter immediately. We add one thing to that and we say, not only should you teach them German and the subject matter, should also help them to keep developing their first language. Why on earth would you do that? They're in Germany now. Why should they keep learning Somali or Arabic or whatever language they're talking? Well, first of all, this is social and identity reason. If you tell someone implicitly that your language has very low status, low value, then I also tell, then you also tell them that they as person have low status. Uh, and that's not a very good way to get, get the engagement going. But there is also a more uh, technical reason for this. I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with Jim Cummins' research on language development. This is old stuff, but still very valid. Uh, he divides your language uh, knowledge in two categories, two, two levels or so two parts of language. The basic interpersonal communication skill, BICS, which is the everyday language that you can talk about tangible things that are here and now, the way that you talk with your friends, with your family. Uh, you can learn that quite quickly. People in lower teens come to a new country and uh, interact a lot with people in the host country. They, they pick this up in months. Grown-ups can do it in one or two years. The second level is the cognitive and academic language proficiency, the CAMP, the school language. This is the kind of language that talks about things that are not here and now, hypothetical things, uh, theoretical things, where you manipulate uh, your own thoughts. This, the, this language is the tool of thought. And as you approach secondary school, you can't complete it without the CALP language. Because not everything is here and now. So if you arrive to Germany and you speak your first language, of course, at home, fluently, and you have come some, some bit away uh, with the school language in your first language, and then you start taking German for beginners, now, school, where does that take place? The, the, the lessons, the subject matter that you're talking about, it's in, in the upper right corner, right? It's a secondary language, your second language on the CALP level. And you don't have time to build all the way up there. It's going to take five to seven years. So what we say is, you want to go, let's see if I can point with this, you want to go from left to right here. You want to talk about the subject matter in the first language and the second language, uh, because your first language is where you're best at thinking. You are simply smarter in your first language. And if you're going to take a complex subject and make a complex uh, discussion, you don't want to do that in anything other than your smartest language. So we say, keep developing the first language. 
not all students look like this. This is a student with a schooling background from a country that has a fairly good schooling system and who went to school up to the time when they left their first country. This is another profile that we sometimes see in students who have a migrant background. Maybe their parents came and then they haven't really got into the schooling system. And this is the toughest cases that we meet because they don't have an age-appropriate language in any of their languages. This is tough. This is both language and uh, level of education of parents. When you, when you get both of those two very strong determinators of academic uh, success, and both of them have the least favorable outcome. So what do you do then? If you only promote the second language, you can get pretty far, but you will uh, disenfranchise students' relation to their home and to their parents. So you get a very strong response for, uh, on the home-school relationship and you develop uh, self-esteem and identity by teaching both languages or teaching subject matter in both languages. If you have, if you lack the language, the age-appropriate language development, uh, then it's difficult to start talking about the complex stuff that you should do uh, with the rest of your friends. So this is another uh, model, same Jim, Jim Cummins. And most of you have seen that before, yes? On the vertical axis, we have the difficulty of the task. How complex is this that we're teaching, right? From cognitively undemanding, or as we say in everyday speak, easy uh, and difficult. And on the other side, the level of context that you provide. If you're doing uh, algebra, it has very little context. It's, it's just X's and Y's, it's abstract. Whereas if you do a lab exercise, it has high context. And normally, you try to stick, stay away from the lower right here. You don't want to do stuff which is abstract and simple because it just becomes moving letters and numbers. And you can't start up in the cognitive demanding because that's too hard. So when you're working with these students, you have to start in the tangible, in context, and the simple. Show stuff here and now. Use everyday language. Move from there to the more advanced, but stay in context. Keep the things being concrete and tangible. Then once you have made it advanced, now we can take the really difficult step, which is leaving the concrete and stepping into the abstract. This is the most crucial step. And this is where you lose most students who have a weak academic um, self-confidence, who think school is not for me. This is where you lose them. So this has to be done um, in a very sensitive way. And this goes into the very detail of what we produce in the project. So when we produce new uh, teaching material, we do it mostly by video. And those videos have this model worked into them. So I'm going to show you a video now uh, where we explain something that is fairly abstract. Uh, how many of you are science teachers? Do you remember from school the, or from, <laughs> from daily life, what's the difference between voltage and current? It's a physics lesson. Yeah. It's abstract. Well, on the tiny level, it's not abstract, but understanding it, 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 it it's not the easy bit. And we're going to watch a film about that, and I want you to, as we watch, try to map out where in this model are we? What kind of teaching is this? Is it tangible? Is it simple? Is it complex? Or is it uh, complex and out of context? And see if you can see what we're trying to do here is go from tangible and easy to tangible and hard to abstract and hard. You can roll the tape. Oh, hast du eine Ersatzbatterie? Fang! Hey, wie bringt eigentlich eine Batterie eine Lampe zum Leuchten? Hä? Hast du noch nie die Geschichte von den Kindern im Leuchtturm gehört? Hm, ich glaube nicht. Es war einmal vor langer Zeit. Da, da gab, gab es in, in einer stürmischen Bucht eine Insel. Auf der Insel war ein Leuchtturm. Und im Leuchtturm lebten tausende von Kindern. Die Kinder waren sehr unglücklich, weil sie in dem alten Turm so beengt wohnen mussten. 
Die Kinder sehnten sich nach dem Festland, wo es viel Platz gab und alles, was sich ein Kind nur wünschen konnte. Die Kinder hatten sich noch nie so sehr nach dem Festland gesehnt. Dann kam eines Tages eine gute Fee namens Ampera und baute eine Brücke zum Festland. Die Kinder stürmten auf die Brücke, um so schnell sie konnten, aufs Festland zu gelangen. Bald wurde es auf der Brücke voll und heiß, wegen all der laufenden Kinder. Warte mal, was hat das alles mit der Taschenlampe zu tun? Genau. Was hat das mit der Taschenlampe zu tun? Nun ja, schau dir die Batterie an. Sie ist voller Elektronen, hier am Minuspol. Die Elektronen sind dicht gedrängt und mögen sich untereinander überhaupt nicht. Sie sehnen sich nach dem Pluspol, wo es Platz gibt, um sich auszubreiten. Genau wie der Leuchtturm auf der Insel. Der mit Kindern überfüllte Leuchtturm ist genau wie der Minuspol der Batterie. Und das Festland, auf dem es so viel Platz gibt, ist wie der Pluspol der Batterie. So wie die Kinder sehnen sich auch die Elektronen danach, auf die andere Seite zu gelangen. Aber wenn sich Elektronen danach sehnen, dann nennen wir das Spannung. Dann kam die gute Fee und hat eine Brücke gebaut. Dadurch konnte die Sehnsucht der Kinder eine Bewegung verursachen. Die Kinder liefen über die Brücke. Das gleiche gilt, wenn du die Taschenlampe einschaltest. Dann sausen die Elektronen durch den dünnen Draht im Inneren der Glühbirne. Die Anzahl der Elektronen, die jede Sekunde durch den Draht sausen, nennen wir elektrischen Strom. Je mehr Elektronen, desto höher der Strom. Und desto heller leuchtet die Lampe. Spannung und Strom sind zweierlei Dinge. Die Batterie kann Spannung führen, ohne dass Strom durch die Glühbirne fließt. Genauso können sich die Kinder nach dem Festland sehnen, selbst wenn es keine Brücke gibt, um dorthin zu gelangen. Erst wenn du die Taschenlampe anknipst, verursacht die Spannung eine Bewegung von Elektronen durch den Faden in der Glühbirne. Spannung verursacht Strom. Strom verursacht Licht. Woran liegt es dann, dass eine Batterie nach einer Weile leer wird? Also, die Spannung fällt, wenn genügend Elektronen auf die andere Seite gesaust sind. Aber sie sind nicht alle auf der anderen Seite. Sie haben sich verteilt. Und jetzt ist es überall gleich voll. Kein Elektron sehnt sich mehr danach, woanders hinzukommen. Und wenn die Spannung abfällt, dann sinkt der elektrische Strom. Das Licht geht aus. Ohne Sehnsucht keine Bewegung. Ohne Bewegung kein Licht. Echt gruselig, auf so einer überfüllten Insel festzusetzen, ganz ohne WLAN. Ja, das hat eine Menge Potenzial. Willst du das Ende hören? All right. So how was that? Anyone of you who didn't know the difference between voltage and current who think that you now understand it. Okay, a few of you at least. That's good. Uh, this, was, this metaphor with yearning and longing as a metaphor for voltage um, was, I think, the 10th or 15th attempt that we did. Uh, we, produced, we didn't do them as films, but did them as oral presentations for test audiences. Uh, and all the traditional metaphors with water pressure or steel balls in a tube or whatever you can come up with, sort of engineering metaphors. They are good for those people who already know this stuff, but they're completely useless, it turns out. For people who think this is scary stuff, this is engineering stuff, math stuff, not for me stuff, they need another metaphor. And we would not have come up with this if we had not tested and tested and tested again on students. So even though this sounds pretty simple, it's just four and a half minute of animated video, uh, it is the result of many hours of experimenting with the sequence and the wording of how we explain things. And you heard um, causation is, is an important concept. It's not just what is voltage, it's also what causes what. Voltage causes current. 
Uh, that turns out to be very important and easily overlooked if you, if you know it already. So, in summary, three big lessons, three main lessons from the project so far is get started right away. As soon as they get off the bus into school, give them things to do, keep them occupied, give them hard stuff, make them work hard. It should be possible but difficult. Second one, what's great for special needs students, what's great for migrant students, is normally also very good for the rest of the class, and especially students with um, low academic uh, level at home or with other special needs. And thirdly, keep developing the first language. Make sure that once, now you have the opportunity to have multilingual students. You can have a student uh, who speaks German and Arabic and be proficient in both which, I mean, is, is really useful for them and the rest of the life. So, um, this is what we learned when it comes to multilingual learning. But there is something lingering here, isn't it? We keep assuming that your school have enough IT equipment to do this, because this is all digital. This doesn't come in books. And how many of you are comfortable with that? How many of you think you have the equipment in your school to deal with that? No, that can be a challenge. Let's talk about that. All right, so how do you feel about this? Digitalization. It is a challenge. Um, a lot of people are a little bit nervous. What if my students know this better than me? Anyone felt that? Yeah, it's natural because they probably know it better. And we know that it's true that if you take traditional teaching, the way you teach today, and just hand out computers to the students, results will go down. Yes, add IT and do nothing else, and your students' attention will be dragged to YouTube or whatever. Uh, so, does it always have to be like this? No, it doesn't. This is, let's make a quick reference to John Hattie, because you can't give a talk on education without at least mentioning the man. On the vertical axis, we have the cost of implementation uh, with ease or low cost at the top. And on the horizontal axis, we have the effect size. And just drop in four commonly cited um, examples. Class size, very expensive to reduce the class size because you need to increase the number of teachers. Has um, not a lot. There is very little evidence that this helps. Homework. Cheap to implement, uh, doesn't really help a lot either. Feedback in various forms. I summarize much of the visible learning in one word here. Uh, low cost, high effect. Tutoring, one person, one teacher per student, extremely expensive, but it works. Now, uh, if you throw in IT into this mix, it ends up over here. It has a small effect, uh, it has a negative effect, and it's hugely expensive. So just handing out computers, that won't help you. So then we ask the project that what we're doing, the multilingual teaching, where does that end up? Well, if you had done it manually with adding one Arabic speaking teacher, one Somali speaking teacher, one Polish speaking teacher in the classroom, it would of course be insanely expensive, but it would probably have worked. Now we do this using technology. So by producing a custom made digital tool that enables a single teacher to address an entire class in several languages at the same time, reduce the cost, and you can do something that is both effective, has a large effect, and low cost. That's really desirable. And now we are on to something that I think you should bring with you into other aspects of digitalization of school. When you go out on the fair and look at all the booths here, you're going to run into some suppliers who want to convince you to do what you're already doing, only do it in the computer. Well, you might save some time, it might be a little bit more convenient, but it's not really changing anything. And there will be some people who want you to do something entirely new just because you can sort of be technology driven, just have computers. Uh, that's not very advisable. What you ought to look for is look for things that we know have a large effect. I mean, the science that we have based this project on is old stuff. Much of uh, 
uh, Jim Cummins and the uh, citations that John Hattie points out, this is uh, research from 60s and 70s. We know what works. This is stuff that we know works, but it's really difficult or expensive to implement. It takes a lot of manpower. It takes more attention. This is just not practically implementable. Those things, try to find a way to use the digital tools to do that. Then you have something promising. And going forward in the project, we're developing more material, supporting more languages and more subjects. But the other thing that we're doing in our lab right now, which I won't show you any examples of because it's in very early developmental phases, is that we're trying out many of these methods that have very promising results in research, where evidence-based results that they can multiply the learning, but they're very unpractical to do in class. We see, can we do those too? Because we have already taken the cost and the effort of providing iPads and computers to the students and making sure that the teachers know how to use them and hand out homework in them and everything. What else is there? Which other didactic methods can we make feasible, make available to you so that we want the digital super equipment belt, the digital backpack to the teacher. If we can give you four or five heads so you can listen to more people, see more people, talk more languages, more hands so you can help more people. How can we do that? And that's what we're doing right now. So with those words, I hope that you have heard something that you will bring with you. I hope that you will uh, keep in touch with us and by all means, Go to binogi.de and have a look for yourself and let us know. Uh, we'll be happy to show you how you can help your students in more than one language. And then, if you choose to join us on this journey, we might as well show you some other interesting didactic methods over the years to come. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, see you out in the fair. <laughs> <laughs>